Thanks, Mike. Truly, we inhabit an age of strategy. It must be. Governments and armed services keep telling us so. They are issuing white papers seemingly nonstop with that word in the titles or the text. For example, a, a short list would include Japan, which just published its first national security strategy in 2013. China issued its first military strategy just last month. The American Sea Services released their refreshed cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power just last March, updating the 2007 edition that was unveiled on this very stage. The refresh marked the, the Sea Services effort to keep pace with changing times and circumstances. And in the realm of combined strategy, earlier this year, Tokyo and Washington revised the defense guidelines governing allied strategy and operations in the Far East. So if generating documents is any sign, governments take strategy very seriously. And strategic thought appears to be on an upswing as well, and not a moment too soon for the United States Navy. After the Cold War, as Frank Fukuyama was proclaiming that history had ended in the political realm, our Navy declared its own end to history. The leadership is issued a strategic directive titled From the Sea, declaring that with the demise of the Soviet Navy, no one could challenge American command of the sea. Thus, we could set aside the first and paramount mission of navies, fighting rival fleets for command, and focus on exploiting command of permissive waters. We could concentrate on projecting power from this offshore sanctuary. The weaponry, tactics, and habits of mind needed to rule the waves languished in the interim. Now that the end of history has ended, a geopolitical competition has returned with a vengeance. It's high time to relearn the art of strategy. The art that lets America, its friends, and its allies, many represented in this room today, survive and thrive in this normal age of power politics. So fostering strategic thought is why this college exists. We help the next generation unlock its gifts for strategic thought, and we then turn these thinkers loose to shake things up. Fittingly then, two of the more workmanlike definitions of military strategy come from right here on Coasters Harbor Island. Our second president, Alfred Thayer Mahan, portrays it simply as statesmanship directing arms. Our students will tell you this is a rare, pithy phrase from Mahan, who seldom used one word when 10 would do. Or you could look at Admiral, the works of Admiral uh, J.C. Wiley, who served here on the faculty after World War II, and who wrote my favorite work of a strategic theory. Uh, Wiley defines strategy as a plan of action designed in order to achieve some end, a purpose together with a system of measures for its accomplishment. So with that, we have assembled a distinguished panel of experts this afternoon to help us understand how statesmanship should direct arms during our return to history, and what kinds of plans of action we should pursue to fulfill the goals bequeathed to us by our political masters. We have with us today, first of all, to my right, Professor Tom Mankin, a stalwart here in the, in the strategy department for many years, a master of the dark arts of competitive strategies, and a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Policy Planning. To Tom's right, we have a man we would have to invent if he didn't exist, namely Mr. Ron O'Rourke of the Congressional Research Service. Take it from me, Ron's works are must read for any specialist in maritime strategy. Scope those out. Uh, we next have Vice Admiral Frank Pandoff, a surface warfare officer returning to, returning to the cradle of surface warfare, former commander of the U.S. Sixth Fleet and director for strategic plans and policy for the Joint Staff. And lastly but not least, we have a scholar familiar to anyone who follows events in Southeast Asia, Professor Carl Thayer of the University of New South Wales at the Australian Defense Force Academy in Canberra. I should add that Carl is a graduate of Brown University and thus has close ties right here in Rhode Island. And indeed, if you look at his tie, he's sporting his, his school colors today. Now, without f further ado, I will be quiet and I will ask uh, Tom to take the floor and take it away. Uh, thank you, and, and uh, thank you particularly for that, uh, for that introduction. And since the, uh, I guess the panel is going to be available online, I can play it for my kids later so that they uh, know what I do for a living. Um, or at least one version of what I do for a living. So, you know, good news is this is, uh, this is the, last, uh, the last panel of CSF. Uh, even better news, at least for me, is I get to speak first. Uh, and given that, given that this is the, 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 final, the final panel, uh, and given that I have spent the, uh, the better part of my career, and I mean better in, in both senses of the word, the better part of my career, uh, studying and teaching strategy, and also for a, for a time 
uh, having the great privilege of advising two secretaries of defense on strategy, I thought the most useful thing that I could uh, offer in the time allotted is to provide some thoughts on the, on the formulation and implementation of, of strategy today. And rather than sort of all the laudatory uh, things, to really to focus on some of the challenges of, of strategy today. Now, before I do that, I, I do want to start with a caveat, which is uh, I'm going to say some, some fairly uh, pointed things. Uh, these are not, however, aimed at anyone in particular. Uh, the challenges that I will discuss represent some, some general challenges that obtain when we try to formulate and implement strategy. So I, I really have three things I want to talk about. First, strategy and, and what is strategy and the challenges of, of uh, strategy. Second, who are strategists versus who are the people who are charged with formulating and implementing strategy. And because of that, what are some of the challenges that we, that we face? So uh, Jim offered a couple of, uh, a couple of definitions of strategy. Uh, my own is that strategy is about how to apply limited resources to achieve your aims against a competitor. So you need to have aims. You need to know what you want to accomplish. Um, and you need to formulate a strategy against a, a competitor. You have, to have a, a, you have to be in competition with someone. Uh, and you need to understand your strengths and weaknesses as well as those of your competitor. Now, strategy is uh, important. I guess I wouldn't be in this business if I didn't think it was. Um, but it's not so important that uh, it overwhelms everything else. Strategy doesn't assure success, just as its absence doesn't ensure defeat. Uh, it does, however, increase the possibility or the probability of success. So you're more apt to do well if you have a good strategy, a sound strategy, than uh, if you are lacking one. Now, one can make up for poor strategy with to a certain extent with other things, with resources. And so one can make up for the absence of a strategy if you have a wide margin of superiority over competitors. But conversely, uh, strategy becomes all the more important when that margin of superiority is narrowing, as it is, I would argue, for the United States today. Now, the, the elements of strategy that I mentioned a minute ago, your aims, understanding of, of, of your competitor, understanding of your relative strengths and weaknesses, each of these elements can be difficult to achieve in, in practice. It can be hard, particularly in a bureaucracy, uh, to come up with aims, even harder to uh, assign value to them. Uh, it can be hard to speak forthrightly about uh, competitors. It can be hard to name, name names. And it can be hard for a whole host of reasons to assess our relative strengths and, and weaknesses. Nonetheless, each of those tasks is really, is really essential when it comes to formulating sound strategy. Now, many people confuse strategy and planning. Strategy and planning are different from one another. I would, the way I would put it is, planning is strategy without an adversary, or Strategy is planning with an adversary. Planning is all about how I achieve my goals within limited resources. I can plan for my children's college education. I can plan uh, a menu for dinner. I don't need a strategy to, uh, to save for my children's education unless somebody's actively working against it, maybe another member of my household. Um, <laughs> But that's planning. Um, that's not strategy. Strategy really only comes into play when you are facing a competition or, or an opponent. Now, and so most documents that purport to be strategies aren't. They are at best plans. Uh, at worst, they are an undifferentiated list of desirable aims. Now, the best strategies, in my experience, and study, you know, studying them as much as anything, the best strategies are written by individuals to be implemented by bureaucracies. And each part of that, I think, is important. Um, strategies are written by individuals, 
and I'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about why individuals matter. But they need to be imp uh, written to be implemented by bureaucracies. So if no plan survives contact with the enemy, it takes a good strategy to survive contact with a bureaucracy. And along those lines, I think the, the strategy that the United States followed for most of the Cold War, a strategy of containment, was a, was a brilliant bureaucratic strategy. It was a strategy in that it was, it was ultimately aimed at, at defeating the, the Soviet Union, but it was a strategy that was well tailored to implementation by a bureaucracy. Formulating strategy is hard. Implementing it, particularly in a bureaucracy, is even harder. Part of the reason why it's, it's, it's so difficult to formulate and implement strategy is that not everyone is constitutionally equipped to strategic thought. Now, having said that, I'm not holding strategic thought as some, you know, some magical power that sets strategists uh, apart from mere mortals. Uh, but what I am saying is that the ability to think strategically is like any other mental attribute. Not everyone does it equally well. Not everyone is a strategic thinker. Um, in, in my experience, some people think strategically naturally. That's true in the military. It's also true in the civilian world. It's true in the government. It's also true in the corporate sector. Some people are just natural strategists. Uh, to take, even though I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in uh, New England, it's, I should say Bill Belichick, I'll say, uh, I'll say Pete Carroll. Pete Carroll is a natural strategic thinker, although I'm pretty sure that Carroll never took a class in strategy. He just gets it naturally. Others can be educated to think strategically, and that is one of the greatest values of, of this institution, educating students to think strategically. And then there are others, quite honestly, who aren't capable of strategic thought. We find those, again, in different proportions in the military, in government, in, in private sector. It's, there's a bell curve. Now, as best I can tell, strategic thinking is not a prerequisite for advancement or promotion, either in the uh, civilian or military ranks. Officers aren't promoted based on their capacity for strategic thinking, and neither are civilian leaders. And certainly, presidents are not elected based on whether or not they are strategic thinkers. They're, based, they're elected based upon a whole host of other things. And one doesn't become a strategist merely by occupying a job that includes the noun strategy. In other words, we can't count on leaders to be strategists. We can hope for them, but we can't count on it. In many cases, the best we can hope for are strategists to advise leaders. And again, I come back to what I see as the, the central purpose, the central value of this institution is educating people to serve as strategic advisors. Now, because strategy is hard, and because not everyone thinks strategically, we tend to fall prey to a whole series of, of fallacies. And uh, I could spend uh, much longer than I have uh, talking about these, but I wanna offer up really a handful of fallacies that I think we encounter repeatedly. We encounter uh, in the United States, other nations encounter uh, as well. The first set, and there's, there's, there's three, sort of three sets that I wanna talk about. The first set, has to do about with fallacies about the use of force to achieve political ends. Uh, and the first two uh, fallacies are really, uh, uh, they're fraternal twins. The first fraternal twin is the fallacy of irrationality. This is the belief that the use of force falls, uh, follows from the breakdown of policy rather than serving as its extension. It's, it's a dominant, it's a pervasive belief in American strategic culture. The belief that the only way that, that a war could break out is, is out of some ra uh, act of irrationality. So it's a deep denial of the, the irrationality or the, or the in instrumentality of, of force. Now it's, it's fraternal twin, which also appears quite prominently in American strategic culture, is the fallacy of hyper-rationality. The belief that force can be used in a calibrated way to achieve clearly defined predictable political effects. Uh, one sees this going all the way from the writings of Sun Tzu in ancient China all the way up to modern game theory. 
and found its expression both in Operation Rolling Thunder during Vietnam and more recently the Kosovo, uh, Kosovo bombing campaign in 1999. So on the one hand, we have this, this uh, fallacy of irrationality, the other, this belief in this hyper-rationality. A second, a second set of fallacies have to do with assessment and particularly the difficulty of assessing our relative strengths uh, compared to those of our competitors. Again, we have a pair of fraternal twins here. One twin is the fallacy of overestimation. Worst case thinking. Prudent military planning, if you will. Right? The, the, the desire not to be surprised by an adversary and therefore to think the worst of, of the adversary's capabilities and the worst of our capabilities as well. But when it comes to strategy, overestimation makes you discard options that you actually have, make you ignore viable strategic options. Great example is uh, the end of the 1991 Gulf War, where we understood at the time that uh, the very southernmost provinces of Iraq and the, the northernmost, the Kurdish areas of Iraq, were in rebellion against Saddam Hussein's Ba'athist regime. Uh, what we now know, uh, due to the captured Ba'ath archives, is that the Ba'ath party's hold on Iraq was much less firm than we, we understood at the time. That every province, save one, Al-Anbar, was in open rebellion against the Ba'ath party. We actually had much more strategic leverage than, than we understood at the time. Now, if the fallacy of overestimation tends to be associated with prudent military planning, and, and hence with the military, its fraternal twin, the fallacy of underestimation, I'll say it's evil fraternal twin, uh, tends to be more associated with civilian policymakers. If, uh, if uh, the fallacy of overestimation uh, makes you ignore options that you have, the fallacy of underestimation makes you believe that you have options that don't actually exist. Think about US strategy post in the Korean War post the Incheon landing, uh, where we grasped for the brass ring of uh, reunifying Korea, uh, something that was beyond our grasp. A final set uh, of uh, fallacies uh, have to do with interaction with, uh, with our competitors, with our adversaries. And here again, I'll offer a pair of, of fraternal twins. Uh, one, which, which goes very much with the uh, hyper-rational view of, of the use of force, is the fallacy of the hyper-rational adversary. The belief that your adversary is uh, calculating, uh, recognizes, notices every move that you make, every, every gesture, uh, and, and acts accordingly. Much deterrence theory is based on that. Much strategic bombing theory is, is, uh, is based on that. Much arms race theory is based on that. Um, problem is, I think there's actually precious little evidence for hyper-rational adversaries in history. Now, its fraternal twin is, is also fairly prevalent, and that's the fallacy of the irrational adversary. I think it's, it's, it's been applied to most, if not all, adversaries the United States has, has faced in one way, shape, or form. And it really stems from an inability or an unwillingness to understand our competitors, understand their motivations, understand their strengths, and also understand their weaknesses. So failing that, failing a willingness or ability to understand our adversaries, we call them irrational, right? Just because we don't understand or don't try to understand what drives them, we term them irrational. Now, I've cataloged these, these fallacies. Um, I think the, what you're expecting me to say now to wrap up is, is how do we do better? Well, I think we, we do better in, in a number of ways, although I don't know that these things can, uh, can be avoided entirely. Um, one way that we can do better is through education. And, but why wouldn't I say that? That's my job, I'm an educator. Uh, but I believe in my job. Uh, I do believe in the ability of education to, to make people at least uh, understand strategy. 
Uh, and I think going with that, we, we also make things better when we, we take the real, the real strategic thinkers and put them in the right positions and empower them, whether they're positions of leadership or as advisors, as advisors to leaders. There's no total solution to, the, to these fallacies, but through education and through, through personnel policies, I think we can definitely raise our batting average. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Tom. You've given us a lot to think about uh, as we try to size up uh, rising competitors in the world around us. That's one. Admiral? Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. Well, I'm very cognizant of the fact that I'm standing between you and Liberty. So, there's two speakers left of the last panel of the last uh, day. Uh, but I uh, thank you, uh, Admiral Howe, very much for uh, the invitation to share some thoughts today on this very important topic. So I want to come at it from a little bit of a different angle, building on what Tom and Ron just did, however. I'd like to talk to the students for a moment about my, my own experience as a strategist and in strategy uh, over 35 years of service. And from that, uh, share five lessons learned or observations uh, that I think um, have proven true for me uh, as, as I've uh, helped shape strategy uh, in the Navy and in the joint world and, and to a lesser extent uh, at a higher level beyond that. Um, in my, uh, my own career, I've had the privilege of participating in two national security strategies, uh, one national defense strategy four QDRs and uh, the Sea Power 21 project that uh, guided the Navy for a period of time prior to CS21. Uh, I mention that because there's an empirical ba uh, base of experience uh, that I was thinking about as preparing for this talk, looking across those different projects to see what were the constants, you know, what, what was something that uh, came up in every one of those, even though they were done at three different levels of national security making. So five kind of thoughts. The first is that uh, strategy development, in my experience, is both iterative and inclusive. So what do I mean by that? So if you go back and look at the empirical data, we issue a new major strategy of one of those flavors roughly every five years. Uh, sometimes this is due to uh, legislation, quadrennial defense review. Uh, but the most of the time, it's not. It's, it's because the world changes. And as the world changes, uh, there's a sense that the sell-by date uh, is, has been reached in that version of that particular strategy. Now, it's become somewhat fashionable to say, and you heard it from James even earlier, that you know, we, we don't uh, invest in strategy uh, in, in, any, in any sort of steady-state manner. We, we, we go to sleep, and then we fall asleep for a long period of time, and there's a wake-up call, and we all kind of rush to, to, uh, to write the next strategy. That has not been my experience at all. Uh, what I've seen is that the, the bureaucracy, to use Tom's term, works pretty hard at this. There's a cadre of st strategists uh, in this town, in Washington. It's not a very big community, by the way. If you get into strategy, you will see the same people over and over again. They're wonderful people. They're very dedicated. And they think and work this continuously. Uh, so it is an iterative process that builds from one version of that document to the next, uh, almost foundationally. Uh, and I think uh, I'd like to make two brief points here. For the students who are about to go out into their respective services, mostly Navy here, but in some cases other countries as well, if you are interested in this line of work, I, I heartily applaud you getting into it. It's, one, it's a wonderful line of work. They're great people. I love strategy. I have three tours in J5, and I tell my strategists in Washington, this is the best place in Washington to work. You're making a difference. You're, you're influencing the, 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 the understanding and thinking of people at very, very high levels. You can contribute. And my second point is just that. If you go out and join one of those efforts as a mid-grade officer, you matter, and your voice matters. And the people who are running these, these, um, these efforts be it writing the next CS21 or the next National Defense Review, they want to hear what you have to say. So don't ever think that because you're relatively junior and what is probably a, a relatively senior group of individuals debating these points, that your voice doesn't matter. 
I have seen time and again in these efforts the junior person in the room say something that really moves the ball and makes a big, big difference in, in the final outcome of that product that goes to the, to the CNO or the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, some, case, some cases even higher. Now, because I say it is inclusive and iterative, does not mean that the degree of change from one document to another is necessarily small. I'm simply saying there's a continuum. The degree of change, and I'll give you some examples in a moment, depends on the degree of change in the environment. Now, if, if there is relatively little change in the environment, uh, yet there's enough change to warrant the new issuance of, of a document, then it probably is a fairly straight line successor to the one behind it. But there have been some times in our history when the world events have changed significantly. And I'd like to give you a few examples of, of those and talk to you about how the bureaucracy, if you will, or the services of the nation did, in fact, uh, tackle the strategic challenge, how they chose to do it, what the product looked like. Uh, and I'll leave it up to you to judge whether we got it right or wrong. And perhaps we could talk about that in question or answers. But before I dive into that, I want to I share one other thought. And that is this idea that, um, and Ron mentioned it, uh, the world is in flux. But I ask you, when was the world not in flux? I think perspective is extraordinarily important. We are looking at some very important changes, but this is what we do. So when I was flying up here, uh, I had my staff uh, download a, a copy of NSC 68, the famous Cold War strategy document that built on Kennan's, you know, uh, Mr. X uh, article. And um, this is how it begins. This was, written, this was written in 1949. World War II had ended. Our, our, our presumptive alliance with the Soviet Union was clearly not going forward. China had been lost, and South Korea was about to be invaded. So, so this, is a, this is a document, highly classified at the time, written by the NSC staff for President Truman. And this is, what, this is how it opens in the president, for the president to read. It says, within the past 35 years, now remember, the Soviet Union collapsed about 25 years ago. So that gives you a sense of the amount of time that they were dealing with. Over the past 35 years, the world has witnessed two global world wars of tremendous violence. It has witnessed two revolutions, the Russian and Chinese, of extreme scope and intensity. It has also seen the collapse of five empires, the Ottoman, the Austro-Hungarian, the German, the Italian, and the Japanese, and the drastic decline of two major imperial systems, the British and the French. During the span of one generation, the international distribution of power has been fundamentally altered. So our, our predecessors dealt with change, too. How did they choose to do it? So Kennan writes his article that says the way to do this is to apply pressure and contain the Soviet Union. It has within it the seeds of its own destruction. And if we, if we are patient and we leverage our strengths, time is on our side. Now I want to pick up a point that Tom said a moment ago. That's a great vision, but what's a bureaucracy supposed to do with that? How, how do you implement that? So NSC 68 was the way the bureaucracy translated that into policy. Now, there's an endless debate over whether they got it right or not. Kennan, quite frankly, as I understand it, thinks they did not, that they over-militarized his vision. But my point is, in 1950, the bureaucracy produced a document the president endorsed that set in, 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 in chain a number of actions that lasted for the rest of the time, the Soviet Union lasted. Containment, the new look, selective pressure, multiplying alliances, forward presence, nuclear deterrence, the 1986 maritime strategy, airland battle. All of these flowed from that foundational document. This is an example of how the bureaucracy builds on a, str on a strategic framework iteratively over time. But they all had one thing in common. It was all about the Soviet Union. That was the North Star towards which our policy was oriented. And then it went away. I was in the Mediterranean in Forrestal at the time when the wall came down. The Soviet Navy disappeared from the oceans. 
And we were literally, as a Navy, at a loss of what to do. Uh, we were sent into port for 30 days. So a challenge, a challenge was issued to the Navy to figure out what it would become. How would it change? And the result was from the sea. And then shortly thereafter, forward from the sea. Now, there are a few people in this room probably who were part of those debates. I was not. But they were spirited, heated debates about the very nature of the orientation of our Navy as we move from a blue water, war at sea focus aimed at the Soviet Navy to an expeditionary focus about projecting power from one domain, the sea, to another domain on land. Fun flowing from this debate were decisions about budgets. There were real winners and losers in the force structure. The communities had winners and losers. This is an emotional, emotional debate. Why do I bring that up? I bring it up because the Navy had that debate. They made those decisions. They implemented those changes. They put the rudder over, and they built the Navy that we needed for the new era. Now, there is an example of, of, of strategists doing their job and pushing, pushing the ship's bow into the right direction. Now, I was involved in Sea Power 21. That came about in the post-9-11 period. Why, was, why did we think change was, why was there enough change to warrant that document? I would argue that two things had happened that, that warranted issuing a new, in this case, a vision statement. One was we've been attacked. We've been attacked by a transnational networked nodal enemy and we needed to adopt a vision of a networked navy. The second piece is that we had the connectivity, the reach, and the precision to do that. As, as late as the 1990 Gulf War, we had to get the air tasking order ashore, physically print it out, fly it out to the carrier, run it to the office, make copies of it, and run it to the radio rooms, okay? That is how limited the, the, the pipes were, the command and control was in 1990, 1991. You look at that campaign, the amount of precision ordnance dropped was about 10%. That's, that was state of the art at the time. Fast forward to where we are today, we are completely networked into a unified battle space and the ability to project precision fires pursuant to the Joint Force Commander's tasking to generate joint effects erases that boundary between the sea and the land. This was the change that warranted that document. And that served us well for about, you guessed us, five years. And then we came up with CS-21. Why CS-21? Well, CS-21 was a, again, fit the times. It was a hopeful document for a hopeful time. We had a confluence of economic factors. We had rapprochement with the Chinese and the Russians. We had threats to the sea lanes in terms of pirates. And we had an ability to leverage a thousand ship Navy concept to produce common security for the common good. It was the right vision for the time and our strategists codified it and that served us well until we get to this environment that we're dealing with today where we're seeing the emergence of the kinds of issues that Ron O'Rourke just told you about. And once again, the teams met, they worked through the process inclusively, iteratively, and they issued CS-21R, which reemphasizes the warfighting centrality and purpose of the Navy and underlines the all-domain access requirement, which gets to the mission to support not only our forces forward, but our allies forward. So when I look at this, I, I am heartened by the community of strategists and their willingness and their ability, and quite frankly, I think their success in, look, in sensing the environment and on a periodic basis, refreshing the visions that we need to guide us. So where are we today? I won't plow the field that you've heard uh, over the last two days. You've seen and talked about the effects of globalization, the flow of people across borders, you've the intertwining of the economies. You've, see you've talked about the spread and dissemination of technologies, which are super empowering not only individuals, 
but are allowing states to leapfrog generations of technology to erode some of the advantages that we have enjoyed and used for our advantage. And you've talked about demographics and how they're shifting around the world, leading, lead, lead, leading to uh, the movement of peoples, and the mixing uh, of, of cultures. But uh, as you look at where we are today, I would, I would postulate, and these are my, this is my opinion, there's still two major factors we're dealing with. The first are states, and states remain the most powerful element in the international equation. States have the preeminent ability to harness power, to focus endeavors, and to provide security. They can provide the greatest potential threat to our nation. And the prescription there is the what it has been and remains. Deter them with force, deny them in their efforts to modify the international norms that we hold dear, and if aggression is to take place, defeat them. Concurrent and simultaneous with the revisionist states that want to change, as Ron would say, key elements of the international order is the threat posed by transregional revolutionary violent extremist organizations. And these organizations are not interested in, in revising elements of the order. They are interested in overthrowing the order. And their threat is not potential. Their threat is immediate. The strategy there is to disrupt, degrade, and defeat. Disrupt their planning and operations, degrade their support structures, remove their leadership, interdict their finances, impede the flow of foreign fighters, counter their malign influences, liberate their territory, and defeat them. It is a by, with, and through strategy that counts on host nations, and it relies on a large coalition who have a common interest in defeating this threat. John Allen, General Allen, and his team have put together over 60 nations that are working this threat every day. The third, the third lesson is the strategies, I think, reflect the military environment. I won't belabor this too much, but tactics matter. Tactics affect strategy. What you want to accomplish in statecraft cannot reach beyond what you can deliver on the battlefield. And as technology has changed, it has impacted statecraft. Think about steam propulsion, submarines, carrier aircraft, amphibious warfare, nuclear power, nuclear weapons, precision guidance, long-range cruise missiles, space-based sensing and communications. When new technologies are introduced in the battlefield, think Civil War, think World War I, there are strategic effects that flow from that. So where are we today? A2AD, the, pro pro the wide proliferation of precision weaponry, hybrid warfare, space competition, cyber attack and defense. There are major changes coming at us quickly, and they will have strategic impact. My understanding is we didn't talk too much over the last two days about hybrid warfare, so I'll say just a word on that. This is, a, this is an area that the doctrine uh, folks are still exploring and defining. But it's real. I would offer that it can theoretically come in three flavors. The first is military forces of an, of an established state assuming a non-state identity and trying to sneak in and accomplish their objectives, their strategic objectives, below the threshold that will trigger state response. Think little green men in Crimea. At the other end of the spectrum is a non-state actor, ISIL, fielding the trappings of a state, rudimentary combined arms capabilities, for instance, something like we're seeing in Iraq. And a third option, and the one that's most commonly cited, would be the blending of state and non-state actors using a full range of capabilities to achieve their common purposes, such as we're seeing in Ukraine. Whatever its form, hybrid conflicts serve to increase ambiguity, complicate decision making, slow the coordination of effective responses. And due to these 
advantages to the aggressor, I believe we're going to see this form of warfare in, well into the future. The fourth thing I've come to believe from my experience in, in strategy drafting and strategy processes is that strategies reflect values. The strategies that our nation produces will be different from the strategies of another nation. So what do we hold dear? Our national interests. And they reflect the values of democracy and human rights, free trade, the rule of law, access to the global commons, and freedom of navigation. These are in our historical DNA. And you'll see them again and again and again in the ends part of the strategies over time. In short, we are committed to preserving the international order that has provided so much progress, hope, and prosperity to so many. And these values do not change. Therefore, they provide a degree of stability that cuts across all of our strategies. If you read the 2015 just published national security strategy, it lists four U.S. enduring national interests. The security of the United States, I'm, sure I'm cutting these down a little bit, a growing U.S. economy in an open economic system, universal values, and a rules-based international order. I would argue if you go back and read the Atlantic Charter, they're not a whole lot different. So the stability of the values puts as a foundation in our strategy processes is, a, is, a, is, of, is of an advantage for us. And that leads me to my final offering, is that strategies, not surprisingly, are built to leverage our strengths. And the constancy of purpose and our support for such widely held goals, goals arms our nation with a set of strengths to which we turn and, and upon which we rely in strategy after strategy. Example, we leverage wide-ranging alliances and partnerships, access granted to us by other nations, shared knowledge and cultural awareness, logistical support, shared objectives and common purposes. These strengths are the building blocks or the planks from which we fashion our strategies again and again and again. And we are very blessed to have them. Now I'll conclude with, with one thought. Secretary Carter gave a speech last week down in Washington where he said something that I don't think we hear enough from our leaders. He said, I am optimistic about the future. He quoted our economy, our innovation, our universities, our energy, our military, and our allies and our partners as long-term advantages for, around which we can fashion our strategies and toward which we can dedicate to achieve our goals. I agree with him, and, and I think as you go out, again talking to the students, to return to, your, to the fleet or to the staffs or to your nations, uh, I think when you get into this line of work, you'll find many of these same lessons learned apply. And quite frankly, we will count on you to take the fine education you've received here and put it to work, sense the environment, look at the military environment, look at our goals and values, and help us fashion the next set of strategies for our nation, for our allies and partners. Thank you very much. Thanks for the insider look, uh, Admiral. Uh, and last but not least, we'll turn to Carl. Good afternoon. Can you hear me from here? I feel like the last batsman coming in after a long cricket match, and my, I have to work out a strategy. Do I just keep batting until time's up, or do I try to up the score rate? Uh, but anyway, I'd like to begin by thanking the Naval War College uh, for the invitation to be here, and I'm going to end where Pat Cronin began, uh, focusing on the South China Sea. I've, uh, okay, it's, okay, right. I frame my talk with the guidance I got that described this current strategy forum, and this is my second. I was here two years ago and told all the white uniform people you didn't have an asymmetric strategy to deal with China and the South China Sea. And here I'm back trying to fill in the blanks, uh, if I can. 
But this just suggests that we already know what, what we see up here. The international landscape is, is rapidly becoming more contested and dangerous. And the guidance talks about new domains. Well, I'm going to look at the South China Sea, where the Navy is, is, is and will be encountering legal contestation by China and non-military instruments, such as maritime law enforcement agencies, coast guards, fishing fleets, which are state militias, oil industry mega uh, exploration rigs that are parked in exclusive economic zones of other states. And this environment will get more contested in military terms as China develops its military forces. So why is the South China Sea uh, important? There we go. From an Australian perspective, but your perspective as well, those red lines are the intensity of the sea lines of communication where global trade and energy resources flow to China, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. And what's not shown here, of course, is that Australia is one of the most Northeast Asia-dependent countries in the world because our resources go to China, Japan, South Korea as well. So our sea lines through the South China Sea are highly important. It's also the transit route, as you would know, for the American military to come from the Pacific to the Indian Ocean to pivot or to shift as Middle East contingencies wax and wane uh, and resources are drawn from the Pacific Command or return there themselves. The South China Sea passes through the heart of the Southeast Asia region, which has a regional organization, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which is trying to claim centrality and being in the driver's seat for the regional security architecture. So what about the South China Sea in particular? It is contested. And the constitution of the global oceans, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, is being contested. And we have a, a legal contestation that we're facing. We see here nine dashed lines on a map issued by China, which have not been defined with precision but we see China's attempts to enforce uh, its notions of sovereign and sovereign sovereignty and sovereign jurisdiction within those nine dash lines. We have China in conflict with Vietnam that claims the Paracels and Spratleys as well. Taiwan, which actually has a presence there, also has similar claims. The Philippines, Malaysia, and Brunei. But the interests of Singapore and Indonesia are also affected. The Philippines is our only uh, treaty ally, and that the point I'll return to later. How have nations attempted to assert their claims? Well, here's a chart from the Office of Naval Intelligence. The bigger the ship, the heavier its weight <laughs> in tons. And we start with China. I, this is not my color combination, because I know it doesn't work for, for clarity. But all the red up at the top is China, 205 maritime law enforcement vessels, followed by Japan, followed by Vietnam. And this, as the size decreases, you're moving from 5, 10, 5, 3,000 to 1,000 tons. You're coming down very small. And then you have Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines with four. And that's an island archipelago state. This is the cutting edge of China's assertiveness in the South China Sea. And that's why two years ago I said, you can't mix match gray ships against white ships. Uh, that creates an awful lot of problems. So what is, and, and they are accompanied by Fishermen who are part of state militia linked with SAT navigation systems, the Beidou system, with the, with the regular Navy maintaining an over-horizon presence, and in a few instances in the last 10 years, intervening when necessary. But let's take a strategic look. We know that since the crisis in Taiwan 95, China wants to push the U.S. ability to maneuver and operate within that first island chain as far out as it possibly can. And that has the South China Sea dimension. I'm not going to get into A2 AD, that's Pentagon, it's counter intervention uh, from the Chinese point of view. But they also have an interest in protecting their own sea lines of communication. And they fear what one leader called the Malacca dilemma, that the US could close off choke points uh, in, in a time of crisis. I'm not going to get into that. But what I want to do is then focus on Hainan, uh, Hainan Island, uh, which is, this doesn't have a laser printer, but just above where the word Vietnam appears, where China has, since the late 2000, 2008, constructed a major naval base. This base will hold the projected development of China's nuclear attack and nuclear ballistic submarines. 
Otherwise, they're hemmed in that first island chain. They need to get out into the Western Pacific, and as China develops, be able to strike continental United States with multiply independent warheads. This naval port will host aircraft carriers as they come on stream because the infrastructure has been built, and large amphibious assault uh, groups. Hainan Island ho will host a, a 2016 new space launch center for heavy space launch vehicles with low satellite orbiting ca capabilities. So China is laying in ground the ability to exert control, sea control, over the South China Sea. And we now turn to, uh, and I will have difficulty, I've just written an article, Ch no, China is not reclaiming land in the South China Sea. That term is misused in ordinary English. There's no island features in which have deteriorated environmentally or by human that needs to be restored. And it's a term that's not appropriate uh, legally. All the features that China has built on has resulted from dredging the seabed and scraping coral reefs to create artificial islands. Each and every one of them is part of the Republic of the Philippines' claim to the arbitral tribunal that argues and asks for a determination of their status. According to the Philippines, they are either all low tide elevations, which is submerged for the army blokes in here, or they're rocks. And the nine dash line should be declared illegal because it interferes with the Philippines' ability of its military and commercial vessels uh, to go through there. And we are this in Australia, but since you also get the same TV coverage, probably seen the wonderful photos of the construction that has occurred on here. And this is just one of the, the, the major ones, which in some 2,000 acres, if you're from Australia, it's uh, eight square kilometers, and we deal with metrics, uh, 809 hectares, or three, three square miles. That's the amount of territory uh, China has uh, reclaimed, to use that term. Fiery Cross Reef, uh, pictured here, has a runway of 3,000 odd meters and is a, a, a civilian. I just take the, the, any Chinese built aircraft presently existing can land and take off from this island in the future. Philippine briefers see that Mischief Reef uh, and Subi perhaps will also hold uh, airstrips in the future its state. So if we take that, and I want to move on, China has just announced that it is that it will complete its reclamation project soon as part of its South China Sea construction in parts of the Spratly Islands. And once the land reclamation is complete, building will begin on facilities that can fulfill the relevant functions. And they have identified military defense needs as one of those functions. So why, and the speculation could be timing, China pushes and aren't we so relieved that they've stopped, but they end up with the artificial islands? And this is just on the eve of what we just heard from Secretary Paulson, the strategic and economic dialogue, his expanded one, about to meet in Washington. The beginning in July of the arbitral tribunal hearing the Philippines' case on what they're going to claim are low tide elevations, <laughs> which have been converted into artificial islands and of course the visit of uh, Xi Jinping to Washington in September. So what can we do? Here, since I'm not a strategist, I uh, will borrow from point, okay, from a letter penned in March 18th, 2015 by Senator John McCain and the ranking member of the Senate Armed Services Committee along with Senator Bob Corker and the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that they sent to Secretaries Carter and, and Kelly, uh, Kerry. Without a comprehensive strategy for addressing China's broader policy, they argue, uh, and, and conduct to assert sovereignty claims in the South China Sea, including land reclamation and construction activities, long-standing interests of the United States as well as our allies and partners stand at considerable risk. And further in their letter, they write, we believe that a formal policy and clearly articulated strategy to address these forms of Chinese coercion are essential. So what should be the purpose of the strategy? Well, 
The object, in my view, should be to convince China that there is more to be gained by adhering to international laws, including the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and the peaceful settlement of maritime disputes in the South China Sea, than by intimidation, illegal action, and coercion. And a comprehensive US strategy should be aimed at preventing China from militarizing these artificial islands. We can't prevent their, their being built, they are, uh, that it has created. So, how to achieve this? Senator, the Se Senator McCain and his other uh, signatories set out six areas. Uh, Ron from the Congressional Research Service can only talk about making assessments, and I can venture down into that fraught area uh, as an American citizen having lived in Australia for the last 40 odd years. Uh, maybe seen it out of touch, but I'm also a naturalized Australian and part of this alliance system, so I think I, I can make uh, comments from both. Well, first, they, what, what are the specific actions the U.S. can take to slow down or, China, or stop China's land reclamation activities? This was written in March, so China's now going to stop it. But one is to assert freedom of navigation over flight by naval ships and military aircraft. And I think it is to not recognize the status of artificial islands other than features that are entitled to a safety zone of 500 meters. Simple as that. Not 12 nautical miles, because these Chinese features, if they took 12 nautical miles, would overlap with the 12 nautical miles of features occupied by Vietnam. And so even conceding that is to concede that China's right, and it also has some claim to, to features that are low tide elevations. Assert the right of innocent passage, and that I think means very careful orchestration uh, through this. And by the way, not just the US, I would argue Australia, because unlike the US, Australia has signed UNCLOS, and there's consideration for political ends that if there is interference by China, Australia might be able to take a complaint about its, about its high sea rights being interfered with in a way that the US couldn't because it's not a signatory, and even Japan. And that's a, how you've added, I think, uh, into that particular relationship. And to conduct relatively military exercises with allies and partners. China comes down every year between May and August. Let's occupy some of those spaces. America does, uh, I'm fully aware of the exercise series, carrot, et cetera, that goes on. But it's also with Japan, the trilaterals, adding Australia, other countries, to specifically be in that space every year that we too can exercise there and demonstrate a, a naval presence. And I think that's important. Reassurance, reassurance, reassurance is what all the Southeast Asian countries I visit, except Cambodia, want to hear. The second uh, to counter illegal uh, China strategy was specific actions the U.S. Oh, so here we go again. There we go. Oh, this is. Oh, I'm wondering now, where are we? Right. Here's one of my. Um, more imaginative ones I just throw on the table that could be batted back. In 1999, reacting to China's seizure of Mischief Reef four years earlier and, and fearful that China would keep occupying, China to, uh, the Philippines took a former American LST and beached it uh, on uh, uh, the, and re it's, it's commissioned to their uh, Navy uh, on uh, Second Thomas Shoal. Uh, it is still commissioned in the Philippine Navy. It hosts about eight Marines. So one of my suggestions is, uh, you know, they should invite their American counterparts to come from a little maritime reconnaissance exercise on this boat. And uh, since we eat different tucker food, uh, American could help in the resupply from time to time, even send out a helicopter. Uh, this is a commission ship, and under the Mutual Defense Treaty, if it is attacked or interfered with, then the two allies should consult to see what to do. It doesn't mean they go to war, but it's just a, a demonstration of our legal warfare and position uh, back at uh, China itself. Now, if I get back on track, the next uh, uh, element of the six proposals by the senator, what, what are the benefits of releasing intelligence more regularly about China's destabilizing behavior? Uh, I wrote a piece for Center for Naval and uh, Center for New American Security, and I advocated, but the my policy got published after it was done, just that, opening up satellite imagery. Now, it's Airbus Industries that is doing it to a maritime initiative at a think tank in Washington. But I argue that the DOD should, and I remember in the Cold War, we got Soviet power and pictures of Kamran Bay and highly specific material. It was from classified sources, but made in the public domain, 
We should do the same. We should publicize in a timely manner the details of China's unilaterally destabilizing activities in the South China Sea and elsewhere, that the annual DOD report to Congress should include the South China Sea section. This year's it did. I wrote it before it, uh, it appeared. <laughs> I'd like some more detail. That the uh, PACOM posture statements delivered by the commander should include and address the South China Sea issues. And that the State Department, which last year revived an old Limits in the Sea series and provided a legal critique of China's nine-dash line map, should be uh, pressed uh, to go from uh, first to, to fourth gear, and we should have them continually as China keeps making legal claims, get the best legal minds uh, the State Department has and can consult with uh, to counter China's uh, uh, legal efforts, because China's quite adept at that. And then I note that Senator McCain want, has put into the National Defense Authorization Act 2015 a requirement to report on maritime security strategy for the South China and East China Seas. So this could be, we could play off uh, against that. Thirdly, what forms of security cooperation with China would be inappropriate to continue uh, if land reclamation activities proceed, and what form of engagement might provide incentives for China to alter its behavior? Here I would caution and not recommend at the moment canceling any activities, although Admiral Harris has talked about the possibility of continued bad behavior would be a, not, a, not extending an invitation to the rim of Pacific exercises. But I think we have enough dialogue mechanisms. Someone mentioned 100, but uh, issues that touch from the strategic and economic dialogues, uh, strategic security dialogue, the defense consultative talks with China, the military consultative agreement, defense policy coordination talks, all these should continue, and we should continually press China at each of these levels on these particular issues themselves. We're now, we move from a rule of, of, of behavior, voluntary on, on naval activities, to move to one of air, and I hope that's concluded. Uh, that would be a, a start, so on counters uh, here. So we have existing mechanisms, they should be used, and we should wait now that China has declared it's stopping, because it preempts the suggestions of Senator McCain, and hold that in reserve. For a comprehensive strategy, how to help uh, uh, regional I what am I, am I going too fast here? Yeah, here we go. The, number four, the region's uh, maritime domain awareness needs. One, I'm fully aware of theater engagement plans. I've had the honor of being posted to PACOM from 1999 to 2002, so I'm out of touch, but uh, theater engagement is there. And, and as I said before, when Hillary Clinton said, uh, we're back, PACOM, uh, looked up uh, at times that we've always been there. What are you talking about? She's going to attend a political meeting, but PACOM had been there uh, in, in the past. Anyway, continue current programs providing coastal radars and, and networking. We've done it with Indonesia, uh, you know, Philippines, etc. That's important. Uh, Secretary Carter mentioned a, a Southeast Asia Maritime Security Initiative because uh, Senator McCain was going to write $415 million into the uh, Authorization Act uh, to fund. I'm a bit skeptical that's over five years, it's a build-up period, and he's listed five countries. <laughs> it's hardly enough money, so we're back into the resource questions. It's a start, but it's an it's important signal to China that it could step up. Coordinate with Japan and Australia. Increasingly, we have our trilateral talks before the uh, Shangri-La Dialogue. Uh, China complained a year ago when I attended those. Uh, they're being ambushed, what not? The three got together and each minister stood up, made his statement. If the Chinese felt uncomfortable, well, that's, that's, what, that's what it's all about. And uh, Australia and Japan are e moving ever closer because of Japan's lifting of its guidelines and uh, on weapon sales particularly. And we're considering uh, possibly getting a Japanese sub submarine for the follow-on for the Collins class. Uh, United States has relifted under the ITAR, International Trafficking and Arms Regulation, restrictions on the sale of lethal weapons to Vietnam on a case-by-case -case basis with a focus on maritime security and mainly Coast Guard. I think that might be expanded. If everybody's moving uh, in the big club, moving up to Poseidon's and Orion 3's are gonna be used cars on the lot, uh, there might be some consideration of selling them to countries like Vietnam if they're interested and willing, and then cooperate in those patrols uh, with them uh, to put China off. Uh, and these combined aerial and reconnaissance patrol, I'm, I'm thinking of mixed, getting Vietnamese operating with the Filipinos, getting, uh, I know Filipinos uh, have flown uh, with U.S. reconnaissance, the same with Vietnam. In other words, that China is faced that if they want to interfere, there's going to be either an American or an American ally <laughs> alongside partners in the region. That should 
let's contest the environment back in China's face. Make them begin to, it's one thing to push the Filipinos around, or the Vietnamese, which we don't have alliance uh, relationships, but it's another to start doing when Japanese, Australians, or even Americans are present. Comprehensive strategy, how to, to help regional partners enhance their own capability, it's more of the same. The Southeast Asia Maritime Security Initiative I mentioned straddles both these two areas, maritime domain awareness, capacity building, training, et cetera, more money. There is Coast Guard, Coast Guard to cooperation, but for the Coast Guard officers here, you weren't designed and built to go off and do defense co Coast Guard cooperation globally and haven't got the resources if you're not too busy already. Uh, that's important. Uh, it's in a training capacity. The U.S. is providing metal shark boats to Vietnam. Wonderful, but they're rather small. Japan's giving small ships too. Uh, when I'm in Australia, I reverse it, uh, some of my sporting analogies and say, the Vietnamese or Philippine Coast Guards are like a high school football team paying the pros. Uh, once you begin the game, you're going to be pushed down the field. <laughs> you're not going to score. Uh, but that's the that's beginning. And then bilaterally. So it's more of the same and tailoring the carrot and other exercises for that. Point six that Senator McCain wanted to address was what additional uh, diplomatic engagement with others in the international community? Well, Continued support, if we take ASEAN as the regional association that has the clout and standing, we need to back it. We've got to be careful of going too far in front because they'll be on, they're trying to push a declaration on conduct of parties leading to a legally binding code of uh, conduct with China. They're moving closer to, they come up with a second list of complementarities. We should back that because that gives us the legal cover to, to, to back a regional association in their dealings with China. So we support the ASEAN-centric regional architecture right up through the East Asia Summit. And the East Asia Summit's the ASEAN 10 plus eight dialogue partners. And as I go, what do the following have in common? The United States, Japan, South Korea, Australia. And then you get New Zealand, India, Russia, and China. Either allies, close partners, and then the two. So that's a, a useful venue because it meets at head of state presidential level itself. The U.S. hosted in Hawaii the U.S. ASEAN Defense Ministers meeting. I don't, don't know whether the decision has been made to make that annual or regular, but I highly support that is one. And meeting at the Shangri-La Dialogue. So having said all that, we're stuck with what I call the wild cards. The first that's not on my list because it just happened is the not giving the president the trade promotion authority has put the whole Trans-Pacific Partnership in question. And it led the Singapore foreign minister, they are strategic thinkers, they are realists, and they are uh, uh, strongly on our side to say that the U.S. credibility in Asia is going to suffer. And he said, you either I either all, you're either in or you're out. So this is a, a marker. And I end on the following. The enhanced defense, these are the wild cards. We signed this 10-year enhanced defense cooperation agreement with the Philippines to rotate American forces in, it's being challenged by the Supreme Court. So it's either going to be a green light, good, bad light, red, we have a problem. The arbitral tribunal will begin to hear the claim bought by the Philippines, and it has to make its first two decisions. Do we as a tribunal have authority on the issues before us? And two, has the Philippines made a, a a reasonable claim in, in international law. It's not vexatious. And they have to say yes on both before they can proceed. And then, okay, I'll come to it later. We're having leadership changes all across the board. Uh, the National Party Congress in Vietnam in, in early 2016, just after the 4th of July, the White House will be receiving the Secretary General of the Communist Party. Their Prime Minister will go to the UN in September and pay a side visit. Up to eight members of their Polar Bureau may visit the United States to celebrate the 20th anniversary. Uh, they're thinking all over the place about how they, where they're going, uh, and we need to help shape and reassure them as they elect new leaders and draft strategic policies. National elections in the Philippines, and we could find uh, that the strong President Aquino and his support for us moves back in a different direction, which would strategically weaken access uh, to the Philippines itself. Of course, national elections in the U.S. Uh, I tell overseas audiences the, the rebalance has a shelf life of the Obama administration, but PACOM's presence will continue under another name. So don't get fixated on pivot and rebalance. Uh, the U.S. Navy isn't going home uh, anyway. Then the, uh, to sometime in the first half of 2016, the arbitral tribunal could make its final decisions. Under international law, it's immediately enforceable and not subject to appeal. But what happens if China 
brazens it out. So that's another contestation in the area in which there's an opportunity for the U.S. with the regional association. But we don't know what the ruling's going to be. So it, if we all, yeah, adhere to international law, the referee blows the rule, uh, we have to factor all this in on our particular strategy. And then having sat here, uh, coming from down under, I would then tell you the other wild cards are, of course, what are U.S. commitments uh, to the Middle East and Europe that were also brought up at the seminar. So I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Carl. Let me do my let me complete my duties as a moderator and give you tell you what the cross cutting themes among these uh, four excellent uh, pre uh, presentations were. First of all, the, the greatest strategies that we don't study in any detail here at the War College is Machiavelli. Machiavelli tells us that the key act of statecraft is to stay in tune with the times, uh, adapt, being adapted to as, as time and circumstances change. Which leads to the second point, which is a Clausewitzian point, which is it's really, really hard to do that. Clausewitz tells us it takes a Newton or a Nelson or, or a Napoleon or somebody like that in order to exert military genius, master that mass of data, detect trends, and so forth. And indeed, he seems to he seems to despair of that, telling us that sometimes you don't even recognize trends until it's in retrospect and it's too late to do much about it. Uh, thirdly, I think we also heard that it's really, really hard when you lose a focal point for your strategy. Uh, it's, it is possible to win too big. Uh, for example, in 1945, Henry Kissinger wrote his famous, uh, or excuse me, not Kissinger, but, uh, uh, oh, oh Transoceanic Navy. Yeah, it totally went out of my, totally went out of my, uh, yeah, it's a, I mean, the, the idea about the Transoceanic Navy. It, and uh, Huntington makes the point that, uh, look, the, the U.S. Navy wins too big, its, its competitors are lying at the bottom of the sea, and it is strategically rudderless until it comes up, until a new challenge comes along. Uh, fourthly, I think we heard that the ambigu ambiguity works on behalf of the competitors of the United States and its allies. Uh, the Admiral talked a lot about hybrid warfare. We just heard an excellent presentation about the South China Sea uh, and, and China's ability to use that. So uh, with that, why don't, I turn, why don't I turn it over? We have about eight minutes left in our meeting, and I would like to open it up for a Q&A. Uh, yes, sir, please. Uh, my name is Jay Strauss, War College Foundation member. I'm, I'm confused, and I'll explain why. About six months ago, here at the Naval War College, eight Chinese nationals came here with a program and a PowerPoint presentation titled Cooperation. I thought I had been delivered, and I said, my God, this is wonderful. And what they talked about was the blue economy which in fact is mining the seas and the fish. They claim they have 1.3 to 1.5 billion people, maybe two or 300 million get lost because they have no papers. So they have a protein shortage and they must develop a blue economy, which means fishing. Our current Coast Guard cooperates mightily with China patrolling the vast Pacific for pirate ships and so forth. Both countries cooperate mightily and handily. So now I see almost a conflict which is un not understandable by me. Uh, uh, um, these people were sent over here, their best and their brightest from their best schools, and they were mostly in their mid-30s. They weren't children. And uh, they presented all this cooperation. What happened? Did the PLA rear its ugly head again, or what? Well, the South China Sea is a en semi-enclosed sea, and under international law, China is duty-bound to cooperate with the other states pending a final settlement. It's also duty-bound to protect the marine environment. China has polluted the fishing grounds off its coast uh, and depleted them and so has Vietnam, and fishing fleets are moving further south. But China's nine-dash line has seen intrusions into the exclusive economic zones of Indonesia and Malaysia, in addition to the states we've been dealing with, where there are mother, large motherships and, and large-scale fishing. Malaysia's chose to, to play it very quietly, and Indonesia is getting upset. An Indonesian ship that arrested eight Chinese fishermen 
and put them on a law enforcement vessel was accosted by a Chinese Coast Guard vessel that jammed it electronically so it couldn't communicate back to headquarters, it pointed a gun, and the Indonesian captain released the crew. China claims James Shoal. Well, to mariners here, Shoal's underwater, and it's 22 meters underwater, but they've translated it on their map as a sandbank, and they claim it's the furthest territory of China. And I'm informed now that China's deployed a Coast Guard vessel to, to, make, to just fly, to, to, to orbit around <laughs> this uh, area, uh, to you know, patrol around this area. So, so China, in its both legal and information warfare, promotes cooperation, and they have maritime silk roads and one belt, one road, uh, to the region. At the same time, we have to look at what it does. It, it imposes a unilateral fishing ban from May to August every year in the South China Sea. That was done to, to restore the, st uh, the fish stocks, but it won't cooperate with anybody. The fish don't accept maritime jurisdiction. <laughs> they go wherever they're wanting to go. This is an area that requires joint cooperation, but China does it unilaterally. So I, I say, well, those PLA people may be on the theoretical level of promoting China's cooperation, but provincial and other interests in China are pressing because they believe they have the sovereignty and sovereign jurisdiction over the waters in that nine dash line claim. And so they're intruding on the exclusive economic zones and taking the fish stocks of countries whose coast guards hardly featured on that chart that I showed. So that's what China's doing. Uh, Chuck Kogan. Uh Kennedy School, formerly CIA. <clears throat> our, our country has a history of jumping into wars. 1812, 1898, 1964, 2003, these are the salient points. This administration came in with a vow to <clears throat> take troops out of Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, later, the administration refused to intervene in Syria, and more recently, uh, the administration renounced the idea of a military conflict with Russia. All this adds up to the idea that we must strengthen the role of the Navy and the Air Force, which was evoked by uh, Ronald O'Rourke, and I'd like to get his reaction to what I just stated and anyone else on the panel. Thank you. As I tried to um, illustrate from my own experience that uh, this debate will continue as, as, uh, as Chinese behavior either continues or moderates and as Russian behavior either continues or moderates, the Congress of the United States will continue to debate you know, uh, what, what capabilities and how much capacity is needed to assure the defense of the country. This is an ongoing discussion uh, and, uh, and I'm optimistic that, uh, that it will be an informed discussion that uh, ultimately comes to the correct conclusions. Please join me in thanking the panelists. I think we're going to have to call it there and uh, turn it back over to Admiral Howe.